Now, I would like to introduce Johan Norberg. Johan is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, and he wrote a book that I was reading when I was much younger, and it is The Defense of Global Capitalism. I was very impressed by it, and it's already translated to 25 languages. He speaks all around the world, defends liberty, makes videos, he speaks all everywhere, and the, his latest book is 10 Reasons to Look Forward to the Future. He's a very optimistic fella, and we share that with him, because it's about bringing the positive message of liberty around the world, and that's what he does. And so, please welcome with you, Johan Norberg. Thank you very much. Yes, my assignment tonight is to cheer you up, apparently. Um, but I have a confession to make. I woke up this morning and I was a little bit depressed about the world. Because, you know, I flew in from Sweden last night and they now have this um, online live cable news thing that I can follow all through the night uh, while traveling here. So I got to see all those now so-called pundits, the economically illiterate of both parties, the old statist left and the new authoritarian nationalist right. So I woke up this morning with lots of strange dreams and nightmares. Um, and I was a little bit depressed. You know, Groucho Marx depressed. When the way he put it was, you know, I, I'm not crazy about reality, but it's still the only place to get a decent meal. <laughs> so, so I got up in the morning to get my breakfast, and then something interesting happened. I started meeting people, interesting people, who were knowledgeable about freedom and who told me about the things they do in their homes, from Indiana to Indonesia. And they were impassionate about it. I met you, Students for Liberty, and I must say, that cheered me up. Uh, some people here on the stage said that being here makes you feel a little bit old, and in a way it does, but I must say it makes me feel young to meet you. <laughs> but I do notice that some of you are quite depressed as well about the world and what happens right now. And I think one reason why we're so depressed now is that we pay too much attention to focus on the only thing that really doesn't work in the modern world, politics. <laughs> if you just sort of lift your head and look at other places, the economy, culture, technology, science, you notice that progress keeps happening. People keep on doing wonderful, amazing things. So I wrote this book that Walt told you about, the uh, book Progress, 10 Reasons to Look Forward to the Future. Because I happen to think that the best argument for freedom is to tell people about what mankind does when they are free. It's a book about what people do in science, technology, business, all the wonderful things that we take for granted now. I was recently involved in a debate about um, classical liberalism. My opponent said that liberalism is empty. It doesn't provide you with any answers. It doesn't give you anything. We need more than that. And he was right. Liberalism is empty in the same way as a canvas is empty because we want people to be the artists themselves because we want that emptiness so that each and every one of us can fill it with their own dreams and their own visions. That's why liberalism and politics should be empty, because people, individuals, should take all that place, all that room. But when we look at what they do, and that's what I'm doing in, in this book, oh boy, don't they create wonderful things. Just a few data points that should blow our minds more often. The book is about the last 200 years, but specifically the last 20 years. But over those 200 years, 
because of the technologies, the freedoms that people have been given, extreme poverty around the world has been reduced from 90%. 90% of the population live, of the world population lived in extreme poverty to 9% today. Today, we have a bit fewer people who live in extreme poverty than we did 200 years ago, despite this rise in population. So 200 years ago, we only had 60 million people who did not live in extreme poverty. Now we have 6.5 billion who do. That's what freedom does. And look at life expectancy. 200 years ago, it was 30 years around the world. Uh, some people in this room would have been alive. <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> So that's one reason why I, I thank um, freedom for everything it's done and the Industrial Revolution and so on. Now it's 72 around the world. And in the 200 years ago, there was not a single country where life expectancy was longer than 40 years. Now there's not a single country where life expectancy is shorter than 40 years. But we take that for granted. We take all that progress for granted because it's already happened, and we live with the results, and he who has satisfied his thirst turns his back to the well. So we just walk out of this hotel, walk into a beautiful park. We notice that the tourists, they uh, take pictures of the amusing squirrels. Sometimes, sometimes it takes an outsider to notice what's under our noses. A friend of mine told me a story about an immigrant who came to the US to California a few decades ago from China. And she arrived at the port of Oakland and walked through a nearby park. And her immediate reaction was, this is amazing. This is a country where there are no really poor people. And, and this guy said, what do you mean? How did you notice that just by walking through the park? Oh, she deduced that from the fact that there were squirrels in the tree in the park. Where she came from, they would have been eaten immediately because there was no food. So say what you will about capitalism, but at least it's good to the squirrels. <laughs> now this is happening in the rest of the world as well, to the extent that they have liberalized and opened up their economies to the rest of the world and given their people more, more freedom. You're celebrating 10 years today, congratulations. And you know what, congratulations to the world as well, because what has happened during those 10 years? Well, if you measure human wealth by looking at GDP per capita, 20% of all the wealth that mankind has ever created has been created during these 10 years. During these 10 years, we've reduced extreme poverty more than ever before, to the extent that 130 people have risen out of extreme poverty every minute during those 10 years. Now, I'm not saying that this is all because of you, and thanks to you, um, but it's because of this liberty that you champion and defend all the time. The free market has been delivering as never before. But never forget that everything that's right in civil society can be destroyed by what's wrong in politics. We have right now a massive revolt against the open, global, free economy from the populist right and the populist left. The United States has a vice president from the nominally free market GOP who says that the free market has been sorting things out and we've been losing all the time. And mind you, he's not the crazy one. He's not the one. <laughs> he, he's not the one who says that free trade is rape. That's the other one. So, and, and you know, the other side politically, they also want to destroy the open global economy. It's just that they also want to destroy Uber at the same time. So this is what makes me depressed at times. The fact that we've been here before so many times. I feel like a sort of a parent of teenagers, I've told you a hundred times. Frederick Bastia has told you a hundred times. Adam Smith reminded you, he's been nagging about this all the time and still you make the same stupid mistakes, even though you've seen the results when the market is allowed to be free. Why is it that some people think that the Renaissance only happened to other people? Why is it that they think that Adam Smith only happened to other people? It's easy to become depressed 
So therefore, let me tell you a brief story about Anders Chudenius. Anders Chudenius was a priest from the eastern part of Sweden in the, seven, in the 18th century, um, now Finland, the Easter Botten region of, of Sweden. 250 years ago, he was responsible for driving through the first real protection of the free press in any country around the world. 250 years ago, almost to the day right now. He was a true classical liberal, a laissez-faire liberal uh, who believed in freedom of religion, freedom of the press, a free economy, explained the concept of an invisible hand 11 years before Adam Smith did the same thing. He triumphed in the parliament of 1765 and 66 in Stockholm. He managed to not just have this defend the, this uh, uh, protection of the free press, but also improved free trade and lots of other things in Sweden. But he didn't leave in triumph. He left through the back door, embarrassed and ashamed, because his own party had disowned him, had told him that he was too radical. So by a vote of 21 to 11, he was thrown out of that parliament from his own party. And he returned back to Easter Botten, and he sat there abandoned and alone and thought about what had happened. And he wrote in embittered ways about why people don't understand freedom. How, why is it that they don't understand that order is the result of people not ordering others about? but of them finding the places where they seem to think that they can contribute the most. And he wrote bitterly about those who understood freedom, but gave it up and abandoned those ideas when they weren't popular, for their own personal gain or for power. And sometimes it's easy to feel like Anders Chudenius in those days, the father of Swedish classical liberalism. But after a while, something happened. The reforms that he drove through the bay began to show results, and more people began to believe in, in free markets and free trade. After a while, the free press that he had instituted resulted in a more intense debate, and more radical proposal for reforms of Sweden began to, to take a more prominent place in the Swedish debate. And there was a new generation of liberals entering not just parliament, but the press and other institutions in Sweden. And one of the most prominent ones, who also got the king's ear and began to reform Sweden, he wrote a book and a sort of a classical defense of freedom and the enlightenment in Swedish. And he wrote a specific signed copy and sent it to Anders Chudenius, the now very old father of Swedish liberalism. And he signed it to Anders Chudenius, my teacher, the one who paved the way for the ideas that would come later on. At times, we all have to be Anders Judenius, especially when times are tough, because every little crack that we manage to create in that wall of oppression and intolerance makes it easier for the light to get in. And that can be multiplied a thousandfold in the next generation if we do that. We will see backlashes and anti-liberalism now and then, because freedom is fragile, it's a strange new idea, and it's difficult to comprehend, but we won't give up. You won't give up when that happens. When there's a fire, the firefighter doesn't give up and think, oh, it's happening again. I've put out so many fires, so I, I, I won't do this again. No, he just works a little bit harder. He just gets a little bit more water. And we are all firefighters because the other side is playing with fire all the time. And you understand that fire is a metaphor for government force and coercion, <laughs> obviously. They play with fire because they think that, well, can we have a little bit more fire there? And there's a fire and we have to put it out to make the world safe for more progress and, and to make sure that we can continue to on our path. So we are firefighters and as, as David Bose once put it, um, the rule for fire that Smokey the Bear all taught us is the same thing as we should teach everybody about government force and the government in itself. 
keep it small, keep it in a confined area, and keep an eye on it all the time. And when that doesn't happen, and, and when they don't, because they won't, we put that fire out again and again to make the world safe for progress. It might seem a thankless task, because we have to do it again and again. But as Anders Chidenius put it, what our era tramples underfoot, the next generation picks up and gives the name truth. And you know what? We still talk about Anders Chidenius today in Sweden, 250 years later, because he opened those cracks in the wall. Great men are forged in fire. Heroes are forged in fire. The reason why we talk about people like Rand, von Mises, Hayek, and Friedman is not just that they were great thinkers. It was also that they faced an uphill battle, but they kept on moving. They persisted when everybody said that this is awful. They kept on persisting in defending the ideas that that era trampled underfoot, and then our generation could call that the truth. That's what you do today. That's what Students for Liberty does today. We live in a time when we face many new threats, strong and dangerous threats. But you do that. You persist in this uphill battle. You do what Rand and Hayek did. And when we meet here again to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Students for Liberty, some of the names that we've heard mentioned today on this stage and who are here on the, in this audience and on this event will be mentioned among those heroes of freedom and of liberty because you persisted, because you kept fighting when everybody said that this is all over with freedom. That's what you do now as well. So when the going gets tough, to summarize my point, when the going gets tough, the tough remind themselves of what Tom Paine wrote. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in the crisis, shrink from the service of liberty. But he that stands by it now deserves the love and thanks of men and women. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. Yet, we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. Thank you. Thank you.